the Industrial Revolution laid the foundations for many aspects of modern life. Since that time, both science and technology and our standard of living have advanced at a rapid pace. In fact, it seems that we have had multiple industrial revolutions, each coinciding with a set of new technologies. Some economists think we are now entering the fourth industrial revolution, while others think we aren't even finished with the third. Greetings, and welcome to this instalment. This will be my last video of the year, and kind of serves as a prologue for my new series. Today's topic is going to be what has been coined the Third Industrial Revolution. We're going to be discussing what industrial revolutions actually are, and how they have changed our way of life. We're going to be going over what the Third Industrial Revolution means for our current economic system, and lastly, what it means for RBEs as an idea. So firstly then, what is an industrial revolution? If you've read any books or watched any lectures by the economist Jeremy Rifkin, you'd notice he has a very clear and concise view of what defines an industrial revolution. Industrial revolutions are characterised by technical advances in three main areas. Energy, transport and communications. What preceded the first industrial revolution was the discovery of steam power, a new energy source. Thus, the steam engine was invented. We put it in a vehicle, and we put that vehicle on rails. As a result, we had a new mode of transportation, the locomotive. Around a similar time these technologies emerged, the telegraph was invented, which revolutionised communications. The primary resource that fuelled the first industrial revolution was coal, and the energy it generated made possible the creation of factories, which could manufacture goods way more efficiently than before. Local economies became national economies, as trains enabled the shipping of goods to far-reaching locations. All of this laid the groundwork for what is known as the Second Industrial Revolution. Near the beginning of the 20th century, we discovered a new fuel source, oil. Unlike coal that came before it, oil is a mineral that can be distilled into various individual components. Petroleum is one of the products of fractional distillation that was used to take the train off the rails and put it on the road to create the first automobile. Motor vehicles allowed for fast, flexible and long distance travel. Transport within and in between countries became easier than ever before. The world economy was becoming ever more global and with a global economy came global communications. The telephone enabled near instant communication between two distant places. The world was now more connected than it had ever had been. Oil, cars, telephones. A source of energy, a form of transport, a form of communication. The culmination of all of this was the Second Industrial Revolution. After the creation of the Enigma machine during World War II, we saw the emergence of the first computers. What we also saw was the post-World War II economic expansion and the inception of the nuclear age. The dominant forms of energy, communications and transport didn't change in this period, but some innovations, like nuclear technology, were an indirect consequence of World War II. We could perhaps call this an Industrial Revolution 2.5, or merely a conclusion to the second. During this time, manufacturing also became a lot more efficient and productive, and machines began to assist human labour a lot more. Fast forward into the 1980s and 90s, we saw the creation of the internet and the World Wide Web. Around this time, environmentalism started gaining quite a lot of traction. We started noticing much more the effects fossil fuels were having on our planet, and so there was a new demand for alternative energy sources. By this time, the disasters at Chernobyl and Three Mile Island had already happened, and so at the time, nuclear energy had a really bad PR problem, and so the push for more renewable forms of energy started gaining ground. The internet, renewables, and a few other forms of technology have laid the groundwork for the third industrial revolution we are witnessing today. Let's get into the specifics on those. The first component of the third industrial revolution that I wanted to discuss is energy. The widespread adoption of many different types of renewables is accelerating. When we usually think of renewables, we think of things like solar and wind. Solar energy absorbs light from the sun and converts it into usable energy. Wind power, however, utilises the wind current to rotate the turbine and generate energy. Renewables can also take many other forms, including hydroelectric, tidal and geothermal. Despite the bad press, there have also been a fair few innovations in nuclear energy. 
Thorium is safer to use than uranium, and is more abundant in the Earth's crust. Many countries are now working on what are known as Liquid Fluoride Thorium Reactors, or LFTRs. There are also various experiments around the world trying to achieve more efficient nuclear fusion. All of the energy sources that I have just mentioned are cleaner, safer, and cheaper than fossil fuels, and in the long run, could potentially generate much more energy. But those aren't the only advantages. Renewables like solar and wind are actually portable, and so can be applied to things like vehicles and mobile homes, meaning you can go anywhere and always have a source of electricity nearby. Solar would be quite handy for things like electric cars. Attach or integrate a solar panel into the roof of a car, and you could make it at least partially self-sufficient. Renewable energy is also scalable. You can either go big, or go very small. From massive solar farms, covering swaths of desert, to a small wind turbine in your back garden, or even home geothermal systems that double as a source of heating. Going off-grid is something that's becoming more and more pursued, and so in the future, microgeneration might become more commonplace. As we will see with other technologies, the third industrial revolution might actually make us more self-sufficient overall. However, a lot of jumps in the third industrial revolution are actually environmentally motivated. The push for renewables and electric vehicles clearly illustrates this. And this brings me on to the second area of the third industrial revolution, transportation and logistics. In doing away with combustion-based fuels for generating energy, we are also slowly doing away with the combustion engine. More and more vehicles are going electric, and many regions of the world plan on phasing out combustion engine-based automobiles by the middle of this century. But our transport isn't just being electrified, it's also being automated. Self-driving vehicles have gained quite the press recently, and it's not hard to see why. Proponents of the technology have often cited that self-driving vehicles are statistically safer than vehicles driven by humans. It would also provide more independence for those with disabilities. Autonomous vehicles can be used in a wide variety of applications, including but not limited to personal transport and freight. However, vehicles aren't the only component of this. Even though autonomous drones are still a relatively new technology, we are slowly seeing the introduction of drones being used in the logistics of goods. But this new industrial revolution isn't just about cars and drones, it's also about new innovations in public transport, namely the creation of high-speed transport networks utilizing a combination of vacuum trains and trains that use magnetic levitation. More and more people are switching from personal vehicles to public transport, and things like maglev trains are a fast and reliable way to provide that. The communications component of the Third Industrial Revolution has actually been with us for quite a while, but has adapted and evolved since its inception. I am of course talking about the internet. It has drastically changed how we communicate with each other, and also how we acquire goods and services. In the mid-2000s, we saw the rise of social media, which since then has transformed our behaviour online. People can now more readily communicate with other people, even those they've never met. Web platforms such as forums allow people to have discourse with each other much more easily, and because of this, internet debate has become more commonplace. The internet also allows us to access a plethora of information that we couldn't have ever accessed before its existence. Information on just about any subject is freely and readily available, and this makes it a powerful tool for educational purposes. On the internet, people can access video tutorials about how to do something, or they can access scientific papers about new discoveries. Sites like Wikipedia provide an abundance of open source information that people can use. Continuing with this theme of instant access, many people no longer buy goods and services from traditional brick and mortar stores. Instead, people are acquiring the things they need online, whether it be grocery shopping, streaming movies, or acquiring other goods. Fast access to goods and services, instant access to information, and instant communication with anyone from around the globe. These three things are what defines the modern internet, an integral part of the third industrial revolution. So, soon, we have, or are soon to have, the prerequisites for a third industrial revolution. But, this industrial revolution will be very different from the other two. And this is because of one thing that will not only significantly change our way of life, but will also create contradictions for the current socio-economic paradigm. The phenomena I am talking about is automation. 
in previous times, industries implemented machinery in order to assist human labour. Today, however, this is going further, and many sectors are starting to replace human workers altogether, including transport, agriculture, logistics, and services. Today, we have the technological capacity to automate a significant portion of jobs. But why is this occurring, and what are the advantages of automation? Human beings need rest and sleep. Machines? Not so much. Aside from downtime for maintenance, automatons can work pretty much 24-7. They can also work in conditions that will be hazardous to humans, making them quite versatile. Within the context of capitalism, automation is also cheaper than human labour. However, automation will also create a lot of problems for the current socio-economic order. Capitalism, and more broadly monetary market economics, has always relied on a model of labour for income up until this point. Things like automation and plummeting energy prices from renewables stand to disrupt notions of money and wage labour. Why? Because of the massive reduction in marginal cost that those things would incur. When we get to the point where most of our energy supply is self-sustaining, and when most labour is automated, things will be able to be produced very cheaply. And when you combine this with decentralised production, through things like 3D printing, and when you can Consider the fact that many people will be unemployed at this point, it soon becomes clear that a consumer-based system like capitalism will not be able to sustain itself, because capitalism relies on labour for income and ever-increasing consumption. And with things like decentralised production, free access to information, automation, self-sustaining energy sources and so on, it will be difficult for notions of consumerism and wage labour to continue to exist. And so a very likely outcome is that just as how the first industrial revolution coincided with with the birth of capitalism, the Third Industrial Revolution will proliferate a transition into a new socio-economic paradigm. This brings me to the final thing I wanted to discuss in this instalment, and that is what the Third Industrial Revolution means for ideas like resource-based economies. Simply put, the technologies gained from the Third Industrial Revolution make RBEs a lot more practical and feasible. The modularity and scalability of renewables means they can be placed anywhere and can have a wide variety of applications and configurations. This combined with advances in nuclear energy makes satisfying our energy needs in a clean and sustainable way a lot easier. Advances in automation mean that in an RBE we can essentially mechanise most, if not all, mandatory tasks. Things like autonomous delivery drones will help out a lot in things like distribution, especially when you make use of things like AI and the Internet of Things. There might be a website where people can choose what products they need and then have their requests fulfilled from there. Maglev trains, subways and monorails are fast and efficient forms of transport. Since magnetic levitation can permit speeds of up to to hundreds of miles an hour, such could be an ideal replacement for most air travel, while things like monorails and autonomous taxis would be ideal transport solutions for short distance. When it comes to producing things, 3D printing will not only allow the decentralisation of production, but will also allow production to be made open source. It will also allow production to be more localised, and many things could be produced on demand and when needed. This would actually contribute to one of the primary goals of an RBE, which is to increase resource efficiency, because 3D printing allows the production for consumption of a wide variety of goods. Having more direct and on-demand forms of production can help massively reduce resource overshoot, which is important as in an RBE, one of our main goals is to conserve as much resources as possible. So then, what we can draw from what we have covered in this segment is that the Third Industrial Revolution and the technologies associated with it make the prospect of a resource-based economy a lot more promising than before, because it means that we now have the technology to provide access abundance, to proliferate efficiency and sustainability, and to ensure the health and well-being of the world's people and the planet they live on. So to conclude, today we have covered what industrial revolutions are, how our economies and technologies have evolved over the years, we've looked at how the third industrial revolution will affect the current economic paradigm, and last but not least, we have talked about what the third industrial revolution means for resource-based economies as an idea. I hope you've enjoyed watching this instalment. I will be taking a short break for the holidays, but will continue producing more content in the new year. If you have enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content from me, and want to learn more about resource-based economies, then subscribe to the channel, and make sure to click on the notification bell so that you see my latest content when it goes live. Sharing videos like these on social media helps the channel grow, as well as spread awareness of ideas like resource-based economies. For now though, this is all from me. I've been Adam Jones, this is me signing off, and I'll see you in the new year.